Good afternoon, honorable senators. When the House was suspended its business at 1 p.m., we were debating the resolution, housing resolution, and I presume we are ready to continue. As many, Chair recognizes Senator Maxine Seymour. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. So before the lunch break, like you said, we were debating the housing resolution. And at that point, just to quickly recap, I had spoken about the importance of home ownership, the fact that a home is the biggest investment most persons will ever make. And um, as such, the importance of quality construction in the process and making sure that we adhere to all engineering standards and whatever other rules are set forth by the Ministry of Works. I also noted at that time that a home is a generational type of investment, Madam President, and I refer to how houses are passed down through generations, even those yet unborn, and how sometimes, of course, persons may decide to live and move in with an elderly parent. Sometimes persons may add on and expand the home while they save money to get their own home. You know, young out of college, young professional, and so you move back in with your family and you save money in order to build. I talked about how sometimes persons might inherit a home, and so they decide to remodel it. And then sometimes something may happen. Your parent gets a little older and not so well, and you take them in to live with you at your home in another neighborhood. And so at that point, you would want to resell the home. Because, of course, Madam President, we would note that there are many legal offices, I think some restaurants and, and other businesses and entities and operations throughout town that are actually the old homestead. Some homes go back a few centuries and all in terms of their existence. And so homes stand the test of time. And even though that initial owner whose hands we may place the key in is the person who would sign the mortgage and pay the mortgage and own the home, that home sometimes goes through many owners over time, in the family and otherwise. And so I said all of that to say that it's very important as a government, and governments are continuous. And so it's very important as a government that when we are constructing these homes, that we ensure that we do so at the highest standard of excellence, just so that that home can endure and can stand the test of time and can be passed down to, to children and to grandchildren and perhaps even resold a generation later. And even so, what I had talked about was the fact that there are so many Bahamians who want to own homes, and that any Bahamian who is interested in owning a home should be given that opportunity, so to do. And so I think what I was doing was proposing to the government a few suggestions, which I will continue with. I talked about the importance of not being being discriminatory in any way when we approach the process. And just to ensure that there's a level playing field. And you know, all the nurses and, and police officers and teachers and other Bahamians who would like to have access to home ownership are given that opportunity. And certainly, I would caution the government not to, not to determine in any way what one's political situation might be. Because I think, as we all know, Oftentimes, especially during a campaign, you know, persons do the whole, um, they do the, the, the headquarters tour, I would call it. So you see them sometimes at one particular headquarters in a particular color shirt enjoying the grill out and dancing to the music and not so far down the road, sometimes you see them again. And so don't throw away the baby with the bath water because we can't determine whether or not somebody who may have applied for a home and may have been approved or close to being approved we don't want to determine what their politics might be because sometimes, Madam President, it's hard to tell. And so the persons who would have already applied to the Ministry of Housing and, and gone to the Mortgage Corporation to get approval, been interviewed, qualify, I was just suggesting that we strongly consider them when we assign homes because it would be very regrettable if because of one's assumed political preference, one would not get access to a, to a home. Because like I said, you know, everyone, they for you, they for you, you straight, man, don't worry about that, you're straight. And we all know sometimes on election day, we see them and you figure 
right at that moment, you're not so straight. And you realize that. And so as long as Bahamians qualify, you know, even if their application is there, just remember, they may have been in the right place at the right time or whatever. So let's not victimize those applicants just because the administration has changed. And so the only color that should matter when it comes to looking at a Bahamian's application should be black, gold in the flag only, and aquamarine. So that should be all that we consider, Madam President. And so just imagine, you know, for example, a, a single mom or even a couple with kids who, for the previous administration, may have applied and, you know, may have been all excited about getting a lot and, and the future home. So they may have started to think about the home and tell the kids about getting their own room and coming out of the apartment or coming from living wherever they're living at the time and really getting excited about turning their own key. It's not fair, and I'm not suggesting that the government would, but I'm just saying to ensure that those same people are still able to have access to home ownership. For emphasis, thank you, the lion. Thank you very much for pointing out my repetition. And so, Madam President, you know, when governments create subdivisions for Bahamians, they ought to be also in the business of creating the best possible subdivisions so that Bahamians can live in a clean environment and at a reasonable cost, of course. And so I'd like to suggest that as we develop subdivisions that we consider the integration of solar components and renewable resources as we develop subdivisions moving forward. And of course, Every subdivision should have a park or community recreational space for growth and development. It's very important for the children, of course, to have somewhere to go. And so let's make sure that as we develop the subdivision that we also right away have the park available and open to the residents of the community. We could also consider in the future possible community farming because, of course, food security is very important. And so. Perhaps we could consider spaces allotted for community farming so that they could grow their own food and, you know, come and have somewhere. Of course, I know the good honorable senator here can assist with that through BAMSI, setting up those spaces. And um, that way we're making these subdivisions not just affordable but sustainable, Madam President. I'd also like to suggest that if, for example, police officers apply and are qualified for home ownership, that they should be strategically placed throughout the subdivision. So perhaps if you have a number of police officers who are applicants and who qualify and who are approved, perhaps you place them you know, on various streets or various corners, along with in general, if there are any emergency type um, personnel, just in case an activity happens or some you know, intervention is required, maybe there's a nurse or a police officer on that particular street or an EMT specialist, and so we could be strategic about placing persons. Madam President, with climate change going on and all the discussion about the you know, global warming and, and the environment and everything else, we know that as a small, low-lying island nation that we are prone to flooding. That's just a fact. And that it is possible that it's going to get worse over time. And so let's always do our best to make sure that we don't just put in drainage systems, but we put in sustainable drainage systems that again, can stand the test of time, and they consider all of the environmental challenges and changes that are ahead of us. And so even though, you know, recently, for example, this last weekend, it rained and rained and rained, and many events got rained out. I passed a few parks with members of parliament, you know, who set up beautiful displays for Mother's Day. They got rained out. My daughter's Sweet 16 got rained out. But what I will say is that the rain that happened on the weekend is only a taste of the rain that could accompany a major hurricane. And so let's be mindful that, you know, flooding, if we saw any on the weekend pass or at any other time and it rains recently, that that still cannot compare to the downpour that would come in a category four or five hurricane. And so we have to make sure that there's no flooding. And even as we address the flooding, like I said, that we don't create a problem somewhere else by filling in one place and then the water has to run off somewhere. And so, Madam President, with that said, I support the resolution for 
the acquisition of the land for Pinecrest subdivision. And like I said, I hope that we do our best to ensure that the homes are constructed properly so that they could last for the generations to come so that the children yet unborn who want to use those homes in any way in the future, that the homes will still be standing strong and standing tall, and that persons indeed will be able to display their furniture in their home, on their floors, and not on any blocks or anything else like that. And so, indeed, I support the resolution. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Seymour. As many? The chair recognizes Senator Ericia Hepburn. Madam President, I rise in this honorable chamber to support the resolution to transfer parcels of land to the Ministry of Housing for the purpose of providing new dwellings for persons at affordable price. However, I would be remiss if I did not thank the youth in Parliament for coming to visit with us, pay reference um, and homage to the HMBS Flamingo, and to congratulate my colleague who just stepped out, Senator Pinder, on his recent nuptials. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully, I, I hope to join him shortly. <laughs> Madam President, I encourage you and our listening audience to just Google an example of the American dream. You would find results which state being successful, doing better than your parents, being financially free, but most importantly, owning your own home. Researching the Bahamian dream, however, will provide you results about a documentary, but nothing that gives such a clear example as the American one. So being the academic that I am, I decided to conduct my own study. The results were not shocking to me. And while the typical American dream is a, a white picket fence, the 2.5 children and a dog, was not stated by our Bahamian calling parts. Home ownership was in the top three of what persons determined was a, a part of the Bahamian dream right after being financially stable. Madam President, most countries around the world understand housing as a human right. These views are expressed in key international agreements that we, the Bahamas, have signed off on. The Universal Declaration, Declaration of Human Rights, the Millennium Declaration, the Millennium Development Goals. Madam President, this transfer would allow our country to start towards the goal of approaching housing as a basic human right. This PLP administration understands that there is a direct correlation to home ownership and economic development. Madam President, to quote a good member from that other place, we believe that the heart of governance is about people and helping them achieve a positive quality of life. Madam President, a house which becomes a home for many is the largest single investment for most persons the majority of their life. There have been several studies, as Senator Halkita stated, that this is normally the first step to wealth accumulation. While for some, these homes may not be important. However, for several Bahamians, this will be the only pathway to home ownership. Madam President, we all agree that this resolution is a sound one. And it is clear that the Minister of Housing is headed in the right direction. Minister Colby Davis listens and has ensured that she has met with several organizations representing persons with disabilities to ensure that this group is not disenfranchised. We need to ensure that we are the government of all citizens, and this PLP administration is ensuring that we reach that mandate. Madam President, I do agree with Senator Rami and his discourse when he stated that we must ensure that homes are built properly. The homes at Pinecrest will exceed the minimum government's construction. 
standards. Examples are higher foundations. Uh, Senator Piscott went into great deal, detail, explaining each and every one of them. The stronger concrete, the upgraded shingles. We are well on our pathway to not just meet the standards, but continuously exceed them because we don't want to give our people the bare minimum, but the best. We've already been suffering under administrations where we have only met the bare minimum if we met any minimum at all. Because we, doubt, we do this because we understand that we are battling climate change and we have to adapt. That is just the reality. We may not be a number one polluter, but we will feel the effects first. So Madam President, the general public are not being misled. The former administration did not place one Bahamian inside a house, not one. They did not sell homes, they sell dreams, better yet nightmares. Mm. So Madam President, I will also agree with Senator Halkidis when he said we have to ensure that we also assist our people with financial planning. During COVID, several persons struggled to make their mortgage payments. We have to ensure that we have safety nets for hard times. I know as a single person, home ownership is not easy. Without careful planning and savings, and even then, it is not easy. So this is the reality. This means at times to ensure my mortgage was paid, my yard don't look nice. I don't have an actual coat of paint on the outside. I am still driving a car from 2004, that's the reality, but I have a home. But you know, unfortunately though, these were small choices compared to what other behemoths have to make. I didn't have to worry about, okay, mine could pay the gardener to do the yard or help me out with that. But they had to determine, do I pay my mortgage or do I eat? This is the reality that people were faced with. And, and, and still are, but thank goodness for the new day and this uh, administration. We making headway. Correct. Government's goal is to ensure that we serve the people and we have the system where we can, not just by handouts, as some may think, but providing them with hand ups so they have dignity and pride. Madam President, we need to ensure that as we move to creating this development, we take our climate smart building even further. We must make the shift to renewable, affordable energy homes. We can start outfitting with solar power, water heaters, and appliances. If you go to Barbados right now, they're making a shift to having solar communities, totally government uh, subdivisions. Oh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, go in there for research. Almost every home had a solar power water heater. We, we are behind the times, and we have to start catching up with, with the gap. Again, I agree with Senator Rumming when he says we should adopt more housing. While the South Beach Township does sound like a great idea, I only wonder why the former administration that he was a part of did not proceed with this concept. However, Madam President, I am certain the Minister of Housing, when presented with the idea, if feasible, will ensure that there is some development for the Bahamian people. As we are open to listening and taking sound advice, we don't just stop and cancel just because. Mm -hmm. Madam President, we want to ensure the other side without having to reinstate, reiterate, or repeat and say over and over again that we are not an administration that victimizes, but one that empowers as people will be walking into their homes and not an imaginary building. This year, Bahamians will actually be in a home and not wishing to be in a home. Madam President, overall, the Bahamian people want access to affordable, reliable housing, and this resolution would provide that. So Madam President, thank you for your time, and may God bless us and bless the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Thank you, Senator Hepburn. As many, the chair recognizes Senator Barnett Ellis. Can you hear me? 
Madam President, I'd like to congratulate this year's cohort of youth in parliament, which visited us today, particularly Michelle Bibo, who will be rising on behalf of the great constituency of Killarney. Madam President, I hope that one day the Youth in Parliament program will also have a Senate component so that it represents both chambers of Parliament. <laughs> I would like to offer my congratulations to Ryan and Lisa Pinder, who got married on the weekend. Madam President, I would like to recommend that the new Mrs. Pinder be hereafter known as the Lion Tamer. Oh! <laughs> I rise to contribute on the debate on, house, on the housing resolution. This resolution proposed to convey to the Minister of Housing land owned by the Accountant General for a public person, purpose. But how can I begin to speak on the issue without first commenting on our affordable food issue. Madam President, the government has approved an increase in price for cooking oil, corned beef, evaporated milk, flour, and margarine. I know my learned friend opposite Dr. Hepburn will argue that these are items that we should be consuming less in any event as part of a healthy diet. But the reality is these items are breadbasket items, and they are fundamental to any household in the Bahamas. The government has promised relief. They've promised to look at the gas issue. They've promised to look at rising food prices. They said that they are listening to the cries of Bahamians and that they are discussing options for relief. Madam President, permitting pricing increases on items that were VAT-free four and a half months ago is the opposite of providing relief. Madam President, through you I ask the Minister responsible for economic affairs, where is the relief? He's expressed concern over the country's cycle of low growth. But how is an economy going to grow if the majority of the population does not have money to spend? Who is going to invest in a house when they know that there is a significant possibility that their food bill is going to triple? that their gas bill is going to triple. We have said to the government that we need relief, but the government is racking up frequent flyer miles and hiring consultants, but we are waiting to hear about the relief. This resolution for the transfer of land for a public purpose, for developing an affordable housing subdivision on the southern side of Pinecrest Drive, which is in the Southern District of the Bahamas. Much has been said about this proposed subdivision and this, in this place and in the other place. But first things first, the Free National Movement supports making affordable housing available to Bahamians. I support making affordable houses available to as many persons as possible. In fact, the right to housing is even recognized in some constitutions. It is also recognized in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 25 says, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. For many of us, owning a piece of the rock is the single most important investment we will ever make. It is our biggest source of pride. It is also probably our biggest expense. The drive to be a part of the landholding class consumes many people for their entire lives. It is an indicator of stability, an indicator of accomplishment, and as with most things that drive us, it also makes us vulnerable. We are so eager to accomplish that goal that sometimes we are willing to achieve it by any means necessary. Purchasing land in the Bahamas can be a very risky adventure. Our lack of a land registry means that purchasers are at the mercy of their attorney's title investigation. We have all heard the horror stories of persons who have bought property only to learn that they did not get good title 
and that there's possibly somebody else with a better claim to the land or that they have bought land in a subdivision. There was an open house with flair and pizzazz, splashy billboards, but the developer disappeared without installing utilities or even paving the road. Case law and statutes have developed to protect purchasers and to compel developers to follow the formal process. The Planning and Subdivision Act 2010, f legislation, created a register of subdivisions so that persons could check to see if a subdivision was actually approved subdivision. But as human nature goes, there will always be some unscrupulous person that will try to cut corners. I am certain that we will be shortly debating an amendment to the Planning and Subdivision Act, which will attempt to make airtight the prohibition on selling lots in subdivisions before subdivision approval is granted. This is all further complicated by the fact that there are areas of land in our majestic Bahama land that are low-lying. We are an archipelagic nation. Our supply of land is not limitless. We have to work with what we've got. The Minister of Housing intends to develop a subdivision in an area of New Providence that is near water. This is not high-tech science. Anecdotal evidence tells us that this area floods. On Saturday, in between what I have to say felt like tropical storms, I was inspired by Senator Duncombe's actions in, adva in advance of the last land resolution, and I drove to Pinecrest. Water had collected, particularly in the area immediately behind the houses that were under construction, and in some houses, the foundation was surrounded by water. If the Minister of Housing is going to acquire land for the purposes of creating a subdivision, it is imperative that that land must be suitable for a housing development. It would make no sense to acquire land, even if it's only for $10, only to learn after the fact that it is not suitable for housing. We cannot assume that a subdivision can go anywhere. We know it can't. Previous administrations have created subdivisions only to learn later that they were unsuitable. We cannot make the mistakes of our past. As an attorney, I know that the environmental impact assessment is not necessary for the transfer of land. I know that the Planning and Subdivision Act says that it is only needed in certain circumstances, but the fact is that the government is providing affordable housing. And while there is a real temptation to expedite the delivery of homes to meet their campaign promises, it isn't, more, isn't it more important to actually demonstrate that it's a new day and that this administration is interested in looking after the interests of Bahamians in the long term, rather than meeting the immediate need of satisfying a campaign obligation. Foundations are expensive. The faults in a foundation do not reveal themselves in the short term. They are likely to reveal themselves after years of water intrusion, long after this administration finishes their term. It may be tempting to think that it will be somebody else's problem, but it won't. If I buy a house in a subdivision and learn years later that my foundation needs substantial work, I am going to look after the developer. Madam President, there are ways to mitigate these issues. We can reduce the risk. Conduct an environmental impact assessment prior to acquiring the land. It's not too late. This resolution only gives permission. It doesn't affect the transfer. Confirm that the hereditaments, parcels A, B, and C, shaded pink on the plan, are in fact suitable for a housing subdivision. Table that report. Demonstrate to the Bahamian people that you have in fact conducted your due diligence. It is better late than never. Good governance, good governance is more than just a trendy phrase. Government, governance refers to all the processes of governing. Good governance adds a standardized attribute to the process of governing. It refers, amongst other things, to the process by which public institutions conduct public affairs, manage public resources, and guarantee the realization of human rights. The two most commonly referred principles of good governance are transparency and accountability. Show us that this land is appropriate. 
show us that you have crossed every T and dotted every I. You are the government. To whom much is given, much more is expected. It is not sufficient to say that it is not required by law and therefore not needed. It is, in fact, a new day, a day in which Bahamians are not willing to simply swallow whatever story is being fed to them. The public wants to see the evidence for themselves. You promised a new day. For some, it has been a nightmare. Show all the potential homeowners in the proposed subdivision that you have done all the things necessary to secure their future and the structural security of their homes. This project raises more questions than it answers. The flashy billboard says sold out, but the subdivision approval has not been granted. The land isn't even owned by the vesting entity yet. So how can it be sold out? Selling subdivision land, <laughs> selling land without subdivision approval is an offense. You cannot sell land that you don't own. Another principle of good governance is adhering to the rule of law. So why is it that we are building a subdivision in low-lying land and an area notorious for flood flooding? Are there no good apples? Is there no other suitable land to lay out a government subdivision? Mark Twain said, buy land. They're not making any more. I support providing affordable housing. I believe that although it is not articulated in our constitution, that every person has a right to housing. I believe that good governance requires that governments do not simply govern to meet campaign promises. Good governance requires that this government take all necessary steps to ensure that the hereditaments described in the resolution are suitable for the public purpose which they are to be acquired. Good governance further requires that they make every they make available the public details of their findings and their efforts. We are here for the peace, order, and good government of the Bahamas. Let's get it right. Before I take my seat, Madam President, I would like to take this opportunity to say happy early birthday to my mother, Camille Lady Barnett. Her birthday is on Saturday, the 14th of May. My mother came to the Bahamas in 1976 from Canada. Her friend from university, Arlene Nash Ferguson, said, come to teach at the College of the Bahamas. And being the free spirit that she was, she did just that. And the rest, as they say, is history. Thank you, Mummy, for your unwavering support. You have known what was right for me even before I could see it for myself. It was in fact her idea that I study law. We have gone from being not company to friends. Her dedication to the Bahamas AIDS Foundation is unmatched. Her style and grace is aspirational. It takes a village. And I could not become all the things that she dreamt I could become without her help with my daughter, Camelia. I want to say, have a happy birthday, mommy, and I love you. May God continue to bless you, and may God continue to bless the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Thank you, Senator Bonnet Ellis. As many? The chair recognizes Senator the Honorable Barry Griffin. Madam President, as ever, I thank God for the opportunity to rise in this place with the great honor of speaking on behalf of the Bahamian people. I'm particularly pleased today to rise in support of this resolution to transfer parcels of land to the Ministry of Housing for the purpose of providing dwelling homes for Bahamians of moderate means. Madam President, housing for so many people is symbolic of the Bahamian dream. It means that you've got your piece of the rock, your piece of the pie. And so to watch the transformation that is happening in housing around the country right now is nothing short of amazing. 
I cannot be prouder of the work being done by our housing minister, Joe Beth Davis. No one is more passionate about housing issues than our minister. She knows the difference between smart policies and investments that can make a real difference in the lives of Bahamians and just talk. No one, I mean no one in this country, can say that she is just talk. She's all about action. And we see it every day as she moves around the country, scouting locations, planning, and preparing housing developments for Bahamians. We see it in the many homes that are being built right now, and we are only eight months into our administration. Housing is personal to her because it's part of her personal story. Like many Bahamians, her parents got their start in a government housing development, Elizabeth Estates, a housing development she now represents as a member of parliament. Madam President, if that isn't the Bahamian dream, I don't know what is. And we all have our personal stories of families, friends, and associates who got their start in a, in a government housing development. Sometimes we underestimate the value and opportunity that affordable housing brings to the lives of Bahamians. On the campaign trail, I remember talking to a teen who was overjoyed that his mom qualified for a mortgage in a government housing development. He said it was the first place that he lived where he had his own bedroom and it was clean and it was in a decent neighborhood. He said he felt safe to sit out in his backyard or to play basketball in his driveway. Madam President, we often underestimate the transformation that can happen in people's lives simply because they own their own home. The many real life stories like the one of the teen I just spoke of are the stories we have to tap into as representatives of the people. Sometimes we sit here and debate legislation that doesn't truly touch the people. So resolutions like this cause us to remember why we got into politics in the first place. It reminds us that this isn't a job, it's a vocation that we are here to help the Bahamian people. And years from now, as we drive around New Providence and traverse our family of islands, we can feel proud that we had some small part in elevating the lives of Bahamians, in putting working families and single moms into homes that they own. And there can be no better feeling because we around this table know the generational wealth that can be built simply because your mom or your grandparents had equity in their homes. We know how outcomes in the lives of young people change simply because they live in a safe neighborhood or they have adequate space to do their homework or practice sports or simply because they feel safer and more comfortable in their home environment. It's these things that helps young people to start doing better in school or to avoid getting into trouble. And it's in part because of what we do here in this place, supporting resolutions like this that empower Bahamians to affect better outcomes in their lives. Madam President, what an incredible privilege, what an honor we have. For those of us serving for the first time, we've been in office for almost eight months now. Time is moving quickly. Before you know it, we will be at a year. Our friends opposite often like to remind us that five years goes quickly. So we have to squeeze as much as we can out of the days that we have because what we are doing is an honor and a privilege. We have to do the best for the Bahamian people. So we can't mind the naysayers. We can't listen to the people who didn't build one single home for one single Bahamian in four and a half years. The last administration is the first and only administration in a modern Bahamas to not contribute a single home to a single Bahamian. Let me be clear. They did not help one single Bahamian to realize their dreams of home ownership. So we can't listen to anything they say. But with such a dismal record, we can understand what's happening in this place today. The vigor and enthusiasm from the opposition today, they know they had to come in here and work hard, so they came ready. Their job today is simply to distract and distort. While the PLP is doing good works over here, their job is to make you look over there. 
analogy from my good friend, the Senator, Senator Maxine Seymour. They're juggling the ball now. <clears throat> Madam President, this government has hit a stride. It's clear, and they don't want you to notice. But let me let you in, in a little, on a little bit more on why they're mad today. While we were sitting in here today, the Davis administration announced the sale of the Grand Lucayan Resort in Grand Bahama to, to Electro America Hospitality Group. They will pay $100 million for the resort, and they've committed to $300 million in renovations. This will generate 2,000 construction jobs in Grand Bahama and 1,000 permanent jobs when the resort reopens. They also committed to $5 million to the Ministry of Grand Bahama to enhance tourism within the Grand Bahama community. This is why they're mad today. Yeah. <laughs> Madam President, while we were in here today, the Davis administration has also announced that Carnival Cruise Port groundbreaking will be tomorrow morning in Grand Bahama. Now you see, Madam President, while the PLP is working over here, they want you to look over there. So on top of these announcements today, Madam President, we are here to discuss the PLP putting Bahamians in homes in eight months, something they couldn't do in four and a half years. So Madam President, you have to understand why they're upset in here today. But that doesn't change the facts. And here are the facts. The homes at Pinecrest exceed minimum government construction standards in almost every respect. Yes, All homes will be outfitted with high velocity zone hurricane impact windows. Roofs will be covered with upgraded higher velocity rated architectural shingles. And the homes will be constructed using higher foundations that exceed Ministry of Works minimum standards. Those are the facts, Madam President. The homes at Pinecrest are and will continue to be subject to a vigorous system of inspections led by the Ministry of Works. The project employs two licensed structural engineers, and at completion, a private sector inspector will provide a report to the entities providing financing for the homes. To be clear, Madam President, this is the most vigorous system of inspection ever implemented on a government housing development. Certainly more vigorous than what was done under the former administration, considering that they did not build a single home. So, Madam President, we know our mission. We know why we were voted in. We know that young and old alike, Bahamians want access to affordable housing. We continue, we have to continue to support our minister in making this a reality for Bahamians. We can't and we won't be distracted by the naysayers. As PLPs, we believe in progress. We believe that every Bahamian deserves to have their piece of the rock. We committed to this in our blueprint for change. We said, and I quote, we are committed to housing as a basic right. Senator Ellis, the PLP said in its blueprint for change, we are committed to housing as a basic right. So we agree with you. And we will increase access to affordable homes by creating new initiatives, including homes for Bahamians. We said the Ministry of Housing will return to building homes for Bahamians and incentivizing local contractors. We will pursue public-private partnerships to develop new subdivisions. And Madam Speaker, Madam President, just like that, so said, so done. No slapping up, no excuses, no wasted time. We are increasing access to affordable homes in just eight months. Again, something our predecess predecessors couldn't manage in almost five years in office. Almost five. Madam President, Bahamians have come through some difficult storms over the last few years. We had Dorian, we had the worst of the COVID pand pandemic, and we had the FNM administration. We hope that this worst is now behind us. A new day has come. A new era stretches before us, Madam President. These first eight months, that was just the warm up. We are now fully stretched with blood pumping through our veins. The baton is firmly in our hands and we are in the midst of the first leg. 
Let's run this race with all our might. As my high school track coach used to say, head up, back straight, and one leg in front of the next until we reach the finish line, delivering home after home after home after home after home after home. Madam President, I support the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Barry Griffin, for your contribution. As many? <laughs> the chair recognizes Senator Henfield. Thank you, Madam President. Um, the, my opportunity to sit in the other place for nearly four and a half years, as I'm reminded, was reminded of all day to day. Um, I, I used to hear seasoned politicians on the other side say, you could stay over there beating your chest. <laughs> but then Raleigh's speech and all the rest of that, but the Bahamian people got sense. They smarter than that. I mean, we won, didn't we? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, so I offer. Clearly, clearly speeches work. I believe I believe I'm a senior enough man to offer similar advice in this place today. Say they're beating your chest. Say they're beating your chest. The Bahamian people smarter than that, and they want productivity. That's what we're giving them. That's not giving them not not political rhetoric. Results. Results. And you know, and you know, before I before I do what I want to do and sit down and leave this place for the day. It's been a long day in here. Um, where, where, where they building Pine Crest, where, you build, where the government is building Pine Crest is, is known as a flood zone. It's a flood zone. It's been that way, it's been that way perennially, historically. And you know what's normally said? The proof of the pudding is found in the eating of the pie. So we got time, you know. We got time to see how how them drains going after? How they how they gonna wake up? Huh? No, I'm not wishing that. This is reality. This is this is our reality, right? This is our reality. Our reality is that we have people living in Pinewood right now, who live in a flood zone. That when we have torrential rains, it's like the one we had, the ones we had over over the weekend, they they their homes flood. And so and so for. And, 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 you know, we support the resolution. Both governments, both governments want Bahamians to have their own homes and to be in houses. Yeah, you could sit here and beat us up all day, but we ain't build one home and see how far it gets you. You know? But right now, you're the government. You're the government and you, you, are, you, are, you are determined to build homes and we support that. Because we believe that every Bahamian should have an opportunity to live in his or her own home. I just want to get that little bit of housekeeping out of the way. <laughs> now, now I, I, want to, I want to also um, remember the fallen of Flamingo. And I was, I was saying to someone in here this morning, one of the senators who, who left earlier, that many young men all over the Bahamas joined the Defense Force because of the inspiration of the fallen four, uh, whom we revere in the, in the Defense Force and in the Bahamas, and whom we continue to commemorate and memorialize every year on that fateful <laughs> Mother's Day, when their parents and the Bahamian people got the news of their untimely uh, demise. I wish, I, I heard, I heard, um, Captain Whitfield Neely said yesterday that he was going to pen his memoirs. Uh, there's so many stories that I've heard as a young man in the Defense Force that have to be told. I've heard about how one engineer, Oscar Miller, used simply his cigarette to, 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 to look at the compass so that Captain Rohl and, and the navigators could, could find their way into Duncombe Town where they were seeking safety uh, on the Cuban vessel that they had arrested. 
One part of the story that, that is not told, and I think it has, it should be told, is that here we were a, a newly independent country. Uh, I think we, we may have been seven at the time. Um, and Captain Roll, God rest his soul, um, and his crew, even in the face of seeing the Cuban MiG fighters strafing the water where they were trying to swim for the life rafts and, and the dinghy boats, determined not to harm one of his prisoners, but took them safely into Duncan Town, where they were airlifted and later brought to the capital, and the rest is history. And I think the more we look at that and, and the world that we live in, in the face of Ukraine and other places like that, that is, that is commendable. Agreed. That is commendable. I also wish to extend a belated Mother's Day greetings to, to all the mothers of the Bahamas. Mother's Day is a tough day for me, Madam President. I am now going on into about five and a half years without my mother. And so I, I, I often put the phone down and, and don't do much on that day. And I think a lot of other Bahamians share in my disposition in, in that regard. So it's a tough day. So, so to those mothers that I didn't call, I, Please forgive me. Uh, the young people say I, I probably still in my feelings, uh, um, and so because you know your mother, she's she's irreplaceable. She she is irreplaceable. I'd also like to congratulate my colleague, the, the AG. Um, they say second time is a charm. I see you dressing better already. Yeah. yeah. So so <laughs> so I think it's going to. So I believe I believe it's going to be it's going to be good for you. Right? The second of, of this resolution spoke, <laughs> spoke about listening to, to the voices of the people. Um, said some other things about, then you don't, you know, in, in essence, what he, what he meant was hard head, but it don't make good soup. Well, I want, I want to, to say to the senator who's not, who's not here, the second of my friend, um, that goes both ways. You should listen to the people too. Don't make the same mistake that you accuse us of making, not listening. And the people, the people are concerned about what the government will do about inflation. People are very concerned about that. I, I was shocked when I, I saw a senior member in the government saying that the numbers are down for, for the people who tend to seek social services. I was shocked to see that. I don't know if they just discouraged because there's no more feeding program as, as they knew it formerly. Uh, there's no more assistance in that regard. I understand that there's another program. Um, I'm not hearing much about that program. I also heard another senior member of the government say that it, it's not working fast enough, the social assistance that the people need. What really shocked me, though, was yesterday I watched President jo Joseph Biden, who was speaking to the American people about how he intends, his administration intends to address this issue of inflation and the, the ongoing uh, situation and matter in Ukraine, which, which is serving to exacerbate things even more, because Ukraine and Russia are major producers of grain, and, and of course, Russia is a major producer of oil, and jo Joseph Biden, who presides over perhaps the wealthiest country in the world with the most aggressive social assistance program in the world. Uh, some some would, would say that they, you know, Americans take advantage of their social system in a way that is untoward. He used, he used words to the effect that he was, he was heavy in heart or he could feel the weight upon the, the American people because of these, these circumstances of, of inflation. You know, you get a 5% increase in your salary and inflation moving at the clip of 7.5%. I'm no economist, but I know the little 5% increase you get in your salary can't keep up with the level of inflation that you're seeing. I was supposed to call one of my brothers, my brother in Abaco, or my sister to ask what the price of gas is a gallon because right here in Nassau, it's, it's averaging 
between 6.30 and something like that daily, you know, at the pump. And so, if you were to say people ain't coming for assistance, because they probably, well, yeah, let's say, let's say a lot of them went back to work. That's, that's okay. But if they didn't see a marginal increase in their salaries, going back to work, which is good, thank God for that, um, won't help them that much. Then I opened the papers this morning, and in it, the first, on the front page is my friend. My friend, the Minister for Economic Affairs, who, you know, and, 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 and the headline reads at the Guardian, and I saw a Guardian this morning, and no one could assail this, 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 this honorable gentleman. No one can assail him. But in the business that we are in, we must point out things to the Bahamian people that, that we think oppose the policies that the government ought to be engaged in at the moment. And here, here it is on the front page of the Nassau Guardian this morning, bread basket costs rise. Global factors leave government to approve more price hikes. And this, 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 this in the morning, I was, I was like, what more, what more will the Bahamian people be asked to endure? And these are already trying, trying and difficult times. Now, I understand his rationale, and he spoke was that the minister said that, that you know, external forces, um, inflation, basically, driving up the price and the cost of these, these items in the bread basket. And it's, and it's almost like an automatic thing that the, the supply will come and, and the government will react in that way. But, you know, he's a very smart man. Sit in the cabinet with very smart people, most of whom I have tremendous respect for. And we could be creative in the way that we, we approach this. Now, I, I got some solace from the words uttered from a seat by the Attorney General, which was, we should wait on the budget. And so that, that signals to me that the Bahamian people should have something to look forward to in the way of relief in the budget, because, in fact, it will be the first budget real budget of the new day, of the new day, all right? And you know, we want the new day to be successful in this new day, because the new day, the sun shines on all of us in this new day. And if, and if you're successful, my children are successful, my grandchildren are successful, and, and all of us in the Bahamas, we benefit from the success of this. So I'm happy that the government of the day was in Grand Bahama today, um, completing what we started. <laughs> very happy to very happy to hear that. Very 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 happy to hear that. On a point of, on a point of very order. Very happy to hear that. Uh, uh, on a point of order, Mr. This chair recognizes Senator Ryan Pinder. The the government of the Bahamas was not in Grand Bahama today finishing what they started. In fact, what they started was a colossal failure and the parties to the transaction of what they started backed out of the deal and could not complete and were in default of their agreements. What this New Day government did, Madam President, was we found a new buyer for a hotel that they bought, dumped a bunch of money into, and we found a buyer to pay us almost 100% more than they were able to pay out or they were able to get in their contract with their failed commercial transaction to sell that hotel. So I would ask the member to correct the record in this regard and either give credit where credit is due or withdraw the statement. The only, the only credit you can get from me here today Senator. is what I gave you. It's what I gave you already. I'm happy that you're finishing what we started. That's the only credit you can get from me in here today. And I'm Sen happy that Senator the deal... Enfield. I'm happy that the deal... I'm happy that the deal will benefit the Bahamian people. Senator, I'm happy. I'm happy. Senator Hadfield, are you prepared to withdraw your no, remarks? No, I'm not. I'm not because it's true. I request we that the, the property from Hutchinson Mampour. We entered into the agreement, but we did not consummate the agreement, and the government is simply doing that today. So I don't like see nothing I say to withdraw. Yeah, uh, uh, nothing. Uh, uh, nothing. Nothing. No, 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 no. On a point of order. On a no. point of order. Let's be really, really clear here, because this is a monumental event in Grand Bahama. Their deal collapsed. They couldn't consummate the deal because the parties were unwilling to consummate the deal. We have found willing participants who have paid market value for a hotel in Grand Bahama that their administration 
allowed to just practically fall apart. We saved the deal. We recast the deal. We resold the property for much more, almost 100% than they were able to contract for in their failed deal that actually broke apart shortly after election. Based, uh, the, just let me make a quick ruling on this, Senators. Uh, based on the information before me, Senator Hanfield, I am going to expunge your remarks from the from the record. That's Can you your, please proceed? Thank you. That's your Senator prerogative, Hanfield. Madam President. And no, Madam President, why is which I point? which I exercise, Senator Hanfield. Can you yeah, please yeah. proceed? Why is we on the point, Madam President? I, I want to I want to harken back to the position of the rule, uh, which we were discussing today. <laughs> And you know, Madam President, respect is a two-way street, you know. Uh, Senator Hanfield, right? Senator Hanfield, we will respect if you respect. have an issue with my ruling, you bring it by way of substan substan substantive motion. I need for you to please no, proceed. I'm, I'm I am not going back I, on my I'm ruling. Debating, I'm, I'm not debating. listening. I'm free, speak. I'm free to speak as leader. Of the you know, you, you are free to speak, yes, but you are not free to go back on my ruling, I'm okay? Not going back on your if ruling. you have an issue I'm, with, I'm you bring it by I'm way of substan about, substantive I'm speaking, motion. Thank you. I'm speaking about what is in my mind. Can I, can I what in, in your mind is not my mind before is us fairness, today. My mind is What's fairness, before us today is the housing resolution for fairness, Pine Crest. Fairness and respect is a two-way street, and I think that ought to be practiced in here. That's what's in my mind. That's all I'm saying. I'm not going over your ruling, your ruling again. I understand the rules you're ruling as final. But it is a two-way street. And we have a role to play in here as the opposition of the government of the Bahamas. That's why they call us Her Majesty's loyal opposition. That's the constitutional role that we have to play to speak to the other side of policies that the government may bring. And those policies which we applaud and we agree with, we say, and like today, we agree with this policy, this housing resolution. We agree with it because our policy as well was that Bahamians should be in houses. But, yeah, really, but, we have a right to share our views as we debate in this place. And not all of our views will be liked by the government. That's just the position. This is a place of debate. That's why we have such freedom to debate in here. We are not in a courtroom where I got to keep producing a document to show the court this is my evidence. This is a place of debate. This is a place of debate. That's what this is. And, you know, I could say, I could say the same, this, a similar thing, you know. Who's sitting around the table now while bread basket keep going up for behemoths? Then I hear the comment, but, but fellas sitting around the table. Who's sitting around the table now? Governing is not an easy thing. We understand that. We get that. We get that. But policies must be made, must be sought, that will benefit the behemoth people. And I'm pleased to participate in this debate which will result in the provision of homes for Bahamians. Because that's what we want. That's what Bahamians need. And it allows us to speak more broadly about issues associated with housing in the Bahamas. And some of the issues associated with housing are very clear. Flooding. People living in a hurricane zone and, 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 and irregular Ashanti communities. These are issues associated with housing in the Bahamas. And we can't turn a blind eye because a policy looks nice. It is our duty to point out the challenges that we see arising from such policies. Yeah. And that is all we've come here to do today. Not to be confrontational. Not to, to oppose for opposing sake, but to oppose with a point, a rationale of trying to offer solutions for consideration. That's all we, that's all we seek to do, you know. Home ownership, I believe, you know, is the single largest investment that a bohemian will make or seek to make in, in his lifetime. And contrary to, to popular views, both governments of this country have been part of the realization of this aspiration for many bohemians. You can sit down there, man, and beat up your gum all day, but the last administration, you in charge now. Saying, you, 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 you in charge now. Yeah. You in charge now. Could you please I, I, address the chair? I sat here, to, I sat here today. Well, 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 protect me then. Because when, when, when they, they sit and say things that I can answer them. I, I just I offered you protection, them. Senator Hadfield. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Madam President. You know, Madam President, as indicated by, by the move of the resolution, housing and or shelter are fundamental rights, I believe, of all human beings, regardless of their wealth or their status. And while illustrating the fundamental rights of human beings to housing in their report entitled The Right to Adequate Housing, fact sheet number 21, review one, the Office of the Commissioner for the United Nations High Commission on Human Rights on page three is stated the following. The United Nations Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights has underlined that the right to adequate housing should not be interpreted narrowly. Rather, it should be seen as the right to live somewhere in security, in peace, and dignity. And that's the only point Senator Roming was trying to make, you know. He had, he had the opportunity that many Bahamians won't have to serve in the House of Parliament and representing people who suffer tremendously from the insecurity of flooding. And that this is historical. The report goes on to note important elements of adequate housing as follows. Security of tenure, and our constitution provides for this, which means that they have legal uh, protection from forced evictions and, and et cetera. Availability of services, materials, facilities, and infrastructure, safe drinking water, adequate sanitation, heating, refusal, disposal, et cetera, affordability. When we, when we say as a government we're building low-cost homes, they should be low-cost homes. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't get the information that I wanted to get out of Abaco because I understand housing had some meetings over there. But the, the, the numbers that I'm hearing are not, in my opinion, I mean, I, I guess you have to account Point of order, Madam President. The chair recognizes Senator Griffin. Just, just, just the point of order. Um, I, I don't want to necessarily the say the, the senator is mis misleading, but his statement is misleading. This, this government um, has, has not said that we are building low-cost homes. The term you would hear us using would be affordable homes. That's the government's policy. That's in all our documentation. And so I'm not sure if he's mis mis mischaracterizing it, doesn't really understand. But um, we say we're building af affordable homes. The term low-cost home isn't, isn't used anymore. So I ask that that, that either be um, struck from the record or he indicate where um, he would have gotten that from. Thank you. Thank oh, you, Senator oh, Okay, so let me, let me paraphrase that. You can just take that from the record. You're building affordable homes. Ex Oh, Senator, Senator Hanfield. I, I would draw low cost. If he says he's not doing that, that's fine. I'm going to split no hairs over that one. Thank you, Senator Hanfield. He's building affordable it's homes. It's been withdrawn I, from the record. Expunged. Yes, that's fine, Madam Thank President. You. I, only, I only wonder if he could distinguish for me the difference between affordable and low cost. That's all I wonder. I don't believe he could. Now, that's, it is my belief that he cannot. Right? You, 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 you're talking about the difference between fry fish and fish fry, man. Come on. Uh, tomato, tomato, right? Depends on how you, how you, how you want to say it. But the point, I, that's what I'm talking about in here, you know. What I'm talking about in here is the flexibility of us who sit in this place, who, who are privileged to sit here, to stop nitpicking over nonsense. Because we come here to do serious business. We come here to do very serious business in the interest of the Bahamian people. And we are privileged to be here to do that business. This is not an academic setting. We, we hear discuss in real life that human that, that, that behemoths are faced with every day. You can you can hold me to a strict account over low low cost and what do you call it? What the, an affordable? Let, 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 me, let me let me let me let me continue let me continue with this. That's why they give us these rules of privilege. You know? The same diff different rules that we find in the courtrooms. Availability of services, materials, facilities, and infrastructure, safe drinking water, adequate sanitation, heating, refuse disposal. Affordability. Listen to the UN thing, this is me. Its cost should not threaten or compromise the occupant's enjoyment of other human rights. The UN saying this, I, I, will, I will table the report if you wish. I mean, it's online, it's easy to find. It's right, it's right here. I don't think we need the table because I believe the Minister of Economic Affairs is quite au fait with this report. I heard him saying some things that, 
but I know he is. He's a well-studied man. Accessibility. The needs for all groups are equal. All groups in our country, all groups. Not only the disabled, but, but people of different nationalities, all groups. Location should not prohibit access to employment opportunities, healthcare facilities, schools, childcare centers, etc. And that's the plan that Senator Raming had, trying to elucidate some of these elements that would go into the proper building of a community. That's all, that's all Senator Raming was trying to do. He didn't come to cut no fuss over that. Cultural adequacy takes account of expression of the cultural identity of the community. These are some of the elements that the UN requires. And, and, and you know, in this report, you will see that through some form of commitment that we made and resolutions that we've signed on to and agreements that we've entered as a nation, and, and even in our constitution, we've agreed to follow these principles, these very important principles. So, Madam President, there must be more collaboration by the government, any government, in the design and building of communities all across the country. Gone are the days when a government could determine, listen, I got to put 60 or 40 homes here without consultation with the community and without consultation and buy-in through participation with those individuals that you expect to buy these homes. That saved the base. Fame in law, he's a good lawyer. That saved the base, yeah. Stakeholder buy-in through participation will go a very long way in achieving the best possible outcomes and mitigate most, if not all, of the reasonable criticisms of citizens over such developments. We are in a time now where Bahamians want to participate. I can tell you, being a, being a former member of the government, they tell me you can't just come here making decisions for us anymore, or less like that. Find yourself over here where I am. They want you to come and listen to them talk to them, say, listen, we're going to build, we intend to build 60 homes here. This is going to impact your environment, your community. What say ye about this? And that is the law, as you heard the Attorney General say. Consultation is in the law of the Bahamas. In truth, Bahamian law requires broad consultation with stakeholders before such ventures are undertaken. And he used the right judgment, save the base. It only makes good sense that all stakeholders and the general public, for that matter, are thoroughly informed of what is proposed in their interest before we undertake to do so. Madam President, as we are all acutely aware, housing represents a critical need in our country. And this assertion might be readily proven by the likely thousands of applications. I say likely. Thousands of applications in the housing department or in the Department of Housing. Housing. By Bahamians who are qualified to, 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 to have a home, to be able to, to afford a home in the Bahamas. Even though Bahamian governments have long been involved in the construction and dissemination of, I got to take this out here at a low cost, affordable, of affordable homes, which from all accounts that I'm getting, but you know, I leave that alone. I can I move past that. These are no, yeah, check against delivery. <laughs> what we're building, we have to check and see, in all seriousness, we have to look at and see if they are, in fact, affordable to, to the audience or, or to that demographic of our society that we're looking to attract um, to, to be able to get these homes, especially those behemoths that are financially qualified. And that's why uh, I believe that, yes, our policy differs, and I'll accept that, in, in the way that we Subscribe to housing ventures. This, this administration preferred to go and build the homes for people. Um, it was our view that we provide the land and put in the infrastructure and allow those individuals who, quali who were qualified um, through lending institutions, through lending institutions to, to, to get their own contractors and go and get their homes. Because we, we, have, we have seen where governments have gotten into trouble with contractors simply because we don't, as a government, as governments, we don't carry out the kind of oversight often that we need to carry out to ensure that the contractors are doing what they ought to be doing. You know, when we, when we, when we came to office, I found homes in Spring City, which is 
which is in South and Central, that contractors were paid for and didn't complete the work. Were paid, were paid by the government of the Bahamas to complete the work on homes that people were already committed to purchasing and, and didn't complete the work. And so it was our view that we should get out of the middle of this thing where, where the government will find itself perhaps pursuing a contractor who, who, does, who either does shoddy work or is paid for work that he's not completed. And so that's just a different of opinion, a different of, of policy uh, positions and approach. But the, but the objective and the goal remains the same. We want all Bahamians that are qualified to have a home, to have a home. And I believe that's what the government is doing today. As such, I strongly support my leader's position that Bahamian land must be taken out of the hands of one man, as historically been the case in our country. My leader of the opposition, the Honorable, the Honorable Michael C. Pinta. Historically, historically been the case in our country where it is too difficult for Bahamians to buy land or to acquire land in this country. Currently in our system, prime ministers alone are endowed with the ability to dispense land to whom they will. I'm talking about crown land, government land, the people's land. Not a committee, you know, who sits and determines, um, okay, this, this person is qualified, this application is made, duly made, and properly considered, and we are recommending to the cabinet that this person uh, gets a piece of land, because the, we, we feel that they are in a position to, to really utilize the land in the way that the application purports. I said so before in this place, and I will say it again on this occasion. It's time to make land more accessible to qualified Bahamians, and by so doing, potentially spur a construction boom in our country. Let's get land in the hands of Bahamians as a form of domestic direct investment, which will prove to be far more resilient than the foreign direct investments that we continue to overextend ourselves for. Why, well, you know, I know we had back to the island and these, these different kind of policies and very removed uh, duties and taxes from Bahamians who wanted to go home perhaps and, and build a, a second home or, or enter a venture. But well, we need to be more deliberate, I believe, about how we encourage Bahamians um, to, to participate in such, such policies. It's difficult to do. It's difficult to hit the right mark with these, with these type of policies and ventures. But nothing will change in our country if we continue to just put all our eggs in this basket of foreign direct investment and, and tourism. And when we, what we find is when we have exogenous shocks, the domestic environment sustains us. And so if we can get Bahamians interested in, in, in domestic uh, direct investment by giving them the land, it didn't have to be the individuals, give Bahamian companies the land. Bahamian families and businesses should be treated with the same regard as the foreigner re relative to land for investment. Should be treated the same way, no difference. Madam President, listening to the minister, the men, the challenges uh, associated with, with the acquisition of his own personal home, it, it, it took me back to when I, when I went through a similar process. I probably said so before, but I was blessed in here. I was blessed because my father-in-law, a good, astute Long Island fellow, he had a house in Mount Pleasant. that he said to me, son, you could live in this newly, newly, newly wed, you know, you don't have to pay me any rent or any mortgage. You could live in this for as long as you want until you get yourself your own piece of the rock. So I had a little help, right? I want to speak for those Bahamians who don't have that kind of help. And the prohibition that they have on acquiring land, especially in the city, especially in the city. That is why I continue to be baffled by the apparent shelving of Prospect Ridge. And I heard all of the political rhetoric associated with Prospect Ridge. I, I heard all of that. But I also spoke to a lot of young people who were delighted, who were delighted at the prospect of having the opportunity to acquire property in that area, which they will probably, which they will probably never do unless the government steps in and assists them. Look here, I'm not interested in all of the who did this, who didn't do that, and what wasn't ready. I'm not, in, I'm not interested in none of that. All I'm interested in is young Bahamians being given the opportunity to own land in an area of New Providence where they're unlikely on their own. 
And you can call that elitist, you can call it whatever you like. But that's the position. Whatever it is, fix it. The thing was over, the, 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 the proposition was oversubscribed by young people who were qualified to, to, to be able to go in and live in the way that they, they aspire to live some, someplace nice too. They only want to be in these, these affordable uh, uh, living areas. These are young professionals that we were, we were looking at. People in the media, doctors, lawyers, some public servants. And so if something was wrong with it, fix the, fix the policy. Don't just throw the thing out, the baby out with the bad, the bad water and say, oh, this is with polit and, 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 and clothed in political rhetoric. Make it, make it, make it, make it, a, make it a young liberal, make it a young liberal one. If it was a, if it was a torchbearer one, make it a young liberal one. They, they, I'm sure some of them apply too. I'm sure, I'm sure some of them apply too. I'm sure some of them apply too. That is why I continue to be baffled by the apparent shelving of the development, which is now being referred to as an election ploy. Man, listen, if something is good. We ain't got to, we we'll fix it. A, I, I, I think that it was a good one. Now, maybe, maybe, maybe you have a, maybe you have another idea as to how we can go about it. Madam President, I can talk to you. I can leave him alone. I can talk to you. The truth of the matter is that the proposal make relatively high-end real estate investing in Providence available to qualified behemoths. And it was oversubscribed. That's why I can see no good reason politically, economically, socially or otherwise, to just walk away from such a good project. Well, no, you can't say that now, but you agree with me, namesake. You agree with me. Speak to the chair. I am Madam President. This, this is my friend. I am Madam President and no way interested in what was done or what was not in place. Was, it, was not interested in that. And snide remarks about Google and other nonsense. Yeah, yeah, somebody said here that they say, Somebody said the other day, said, we just Google. <laughs> <laughs> I'm concerned about behemoths getting housing. That's what I'm concerned about. Fix the issues as you've identified them and get on with it. This debate evidences your policy to build and make homes available for, for behemoths. That's what this debate is about today. That is your policy. It's a good policy. We support the policy. We may, we, may, we may decide, you know, differences in how we get to the end of the day, but we support the policy. All right? Madam President, we simply can't have a fulsome discussion on housing and land and not speak to the many, many challenges associated with irregular or shanty communities in our country. We can't. In January of 2018, our administration commissioned a preliminary assessment on report on shanty or irregular communities in the Bahamas. Former Minister of Labor and Transport, Senator Dion Folks, assisted, a multi -agency secretary, assisted by a multi-agency secretary and task force, led this exercise and reported that there were some 428 such households in New Providence. And get this, 915 such dwellings in Abaco. And that's, that's from central Abaco all the way down to Northern Abaco to an area we call the farm. Madam President, this effort, as indicated by the report, signaled the government's commitment toward a significant social, social policy position and reform that would humanely regulate and elevate the living conditions of persons residing in shanty towns. In September 2019, Mahamans and, and the World Watch in horror as Hurricane Dorian took lives and destroyed irregular communities all across Abaco. No, Madam President, it saddens me because I went into those communities myself, personally, more than once, and warned people living there that if you don't move from this, this place, you're going to die. The Prime Minister at the time flew into Abaco, said the same thing. I come to warn people to come out of these communities. No one moved. So, so and every, every, every household that I was stopped to, and I, I took with me Creole speakers, because my Creole is not too, even though I spent six months in Haiti, my Creole is not that fluent. I took with me Creole speakers from the Defense Force and the police. 
And I said, speak to them in their parlance, speak to them in their language, that they would understand that death is coming. This hurricane is coming on a king tide, which projections out, it will, it, will, it will lift 19 to 20 feet above sea level. And it did. And it came right across the dock in Marsh Harbor, right opposite the mud and the P, and brought with it all of those 40 foot and 20 foot containers that were lodged on the dock. And they swept over those communities. And in the eye of the storm, I could not believe my eyes as I saw people coming out of those communities like rain, trying to seek shelter in the government complex. And so we understood the detrimental impact that such events could have on these communities long before Dorian came. And so that's why we seek to, to regularize them in a sense. But what we don't say much, because we use this as, a, as an emotive discussion, something to raise you know, emotions. I'm not into that. Bahamians who were born in the Bahamas are living in those communities as well. Bahamians who were born in the Bahamas are living in those communities as well. And the report showed us that a lot of the homes in, in New Providence, primarily, and some in Abaco, they were built according to standard and code in those communities. In those communities, all right? And so fast forward today, to the day. You know, one of the reasons why we did um, move to, to examine these communities because we had a, a, a fire in the mud that destroyed quite a number of homes. But we, and the reason why is, is, is because these homes are not properly, properly set up. They don't have fire hydrants. They don't have proper roads. People build wherever they find a, a piece big enough to, to, put, to put something, and they build it. No, 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 no roads, no, so the fire trucks, the volunteer fire services couldn't get in there to distinguish the fires. And then, you, and then you're looking at a commercial area like Marsh Arbor at the time, our strongest commercial area in Abaco, which then is exposed to a, a fire gone wild out of control. Thank God I don't, I don't believe we lost anyone in there, you know, wasn't. It wasn't that kind of a detriment. And that was, our, that, that was our focus and determination to regularize these places. And so now we come to the day. And I say this, and I say this uh, with the greatest of respect. Unless the government determines to deal with shanty towns or irregular communities holistically, we will descend into anarchy in this, in this regard in this country. Because Bahamians are looking at these communities now Bahamians who have all the struggles in the world to get a piece of land, they're looking at these communities now, and they're saying, well, if they could come here and get land, or whoever could just move in and build on a piece of land, this is our reality. This ain't, this ain't a defeat of no particular government. This is all of we. This is all of we. Bahamians are saying now, if, if they can come in and set up, I saw a fellow on a video, I, I couldn't believe my ass. Fellow said he can build 140, I believe. So he found a piece, I don't know where he yeah. found a piece of land in the Providence to hold 140. And he tells, he tells someone who apparently was there, you know, he say, move that foundation and put it over there. Say, no, put it over there. He said, no, leave that one. I just can build some more. And so that's the level of anarchy that we're going to descend into unless we take very serious steps to deal with these communities holistically. Bahamians, if they're on the lands and they and they're entitled to be here in the Bahamas, and they built according to code, or made some effort, let's deal with them. If there are buildings on these, in these communities that are not up to code, let's remove them. And so what we had was a displacement of the mud and the pea and sandbanks and Abaco to the farm road. And now I understand on Sherlin Boodle Highway. I mean, I saw it when I went, was home last. They built it, my brother. They built it. And you have, you have an you have a even more dramatic problem than that. You have people, no, I, I could, when you go in, let me know so I could, I could show you where they are. I, 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 I born and grew up there, man. I, I know where they are. I know where they are. All right? You, 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 have, a, you, have, you have an even, you have an even, you have an even more, more difficult problem. You have people who have crown grants who are now leasing land to these people to build. Crown leases. Crown leases. Who are subleasing. And, and, and I, I couldn't believe it. I walked onto a property and I said, look, yeah, who owns this property? You can't come here and build no irregular Shanti community. And they said, well, no, we paid, we paid so-and-so for his lease. 
And I, my recommendation, my recommendation was that the lease ought to be terminated, taken back from him. He's not using it for the purpose that the government gave it to him. I will yield, man. I will yield. I'm very passionate about this. No, no, no. And, and the chair recognizes thank, Senator Ryan and, and, Binder. And thank you for the senator for yielding. Just recently, we 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 just received, or I just received, as the attorney general, the se the same report you're speaking of, in which there are a couple instances in which. Um, Persons who have a crown lease have subleased that land, just as you describe. And you're you're not wrong. Um, and and your solution is not is the correct solution. Is the solution we will be pursuing. If you have a crown lease, and let this be a notice to the public, if you have a crown lease, particularly in Abaco, but if you have a crown lease, and you are using the lease contrary to the to the terms and conditions set forth in that lease. If you are subleasing at sublease, contrary to the terms and conditions of that sublease, those are grounds for immediate termination of that lease. And we are a country of laws, and we are a country of respect. And I take your comment. I just received the report last week, and we will be pursuing that remedy as you described. Thank you for that, Honorable Attorney General. I'm very grateful for that. I, I, I ran into it. I went into to, to Albuquerque with my eyes wide open, you know. With my eyes wide open. I remember a time I could, I remember a time I could walk through the mud if I go to the primary school grounds to play softball and martial ball or basketball, and I could walk a straight line to Dundas Town. After a while, I realized that we had to be zigzagging between, and then you know, nothing, nothing was done about it. So when we determined to address this, this problem in the Bahamas, we understood in the government, you know. We understood, colleagues said to me, you know, this may be detrimental to your political career. I tell them, man, I served in the Defense Force all my life, where I stood on the front line guarding our heritage. And if it takes this for me to come out of politics, well, so be it. This, the patrimony of this country would be for my grandchildren. That, that, that's what this department is, and I'm, I'm encouraged by the Attorney General's uh, statement just now that they are, in fact, this government will, in fact, do something to address this very vexing problem all across our country. Right? You see, I just, I just, I just took away two of my pages. <laughs> just took away two of my pages. You know, Contrary to popular belief, as officials have known for a long time now, these communities do not just consist of migrants and illegals, but also of full-fledged vehemence. And so, uh, uh, you know, the work is in the, in the cabinet. The work is in the reports. You don't have to go and, and, and reinvent the wheel. Um, the work has already been done for you by public officials who, who are still in the government who can counsel and advise on what they found. Uh, we found that bringing together a, a, a cabinet committee to address it, and you know, sometimes the cabinet committees are more harm than good because they, you, you waste a lot of time at meetings and sometimes a one-man gang is, <laughs> you know, you're, 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 you're appreciate what the point, the sentiment I express, right? Yeah, well, sometimes, uh, sometimes you just get on with it, man. <laughs> you know, you grab the bull by the horn and, and you get on with it. Um, Madam President, I am thankful for the opportunity to have participated in this debate, and I pray that God continue to bless the Commonwealth of the Bahamas and its people, and that he keeps us and smile, continues to smile graciously upon us. I thank you. Hmm? I tell you a long time I support the resolution, man. <laughs> I support that. Go ahead. Sorry, Madam, Madam, Madam President, just before um, our minister wraps up, just wanted to um, re re reply to something that the Honorable Senator said, and just because I got a text from someone who said that, um, no, that, that, that it might, it, 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 it does make sense to, to explain the difference between low-cost home and affordable homes, because I'm guessing some people at home don't understand the difference, but um, so, these, these are terms that are readily known in the real estate market, and they do speak of two different types of homes that are sold on the market. Low-cost homes are homes that are sold 
below market. So below what you would expect to pay. So it's below market value or below what you would expect to pay. Uh, those are low cost homes. Affordable homes are homes that are priced at the level of affordability for your target market. So research would have been conducted. Um, a specific target market would have been um, sort of, you know, um, figured out. And the ministry would have priced these homes at that price point. As we know, many young professionals in particular state that the banks simply do not lend beyond $200,000, for example, or $230,000, $250,000, you know, if you're not in a certain income bracket or a certain profession. So these homes are priced at a certain affordable point so that Bahamians can afford them. We're not saying that these are low-cost homes where they're priced below market value or priced below what you would expect the average to be, but they're priced at the point of affordability for Bahamians. So that's the difference. With the hurricane impact windows and all the additional bells and whistles. So that's just to sort of explain for the senator, but also for folks at home. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hanfield, and also thank you, Senator Griffin. I just want to. Um, I, I understand what he's, what he's saying. I understand what he's saying. But I also assert that the market that we're trying to reach are those individuals who can afford homes. That's, that's the only point I wanted to make. Okay, thank you, Senator Hanfield. As many? Thank you, Madam, <clears throat> Madam President. Uh, for the wrap-up, I want to thank all senators who participated in this very spirited uh, debate today. I think we all um, are very, very passionate about the issue. And uh, many senators stated in their contribution that they consider the provision of proper housing, adequate housing, inclusive of amenities and um, utilities to be a fundamental human right and thus support uh, the provision of housing and efforts made to support housing acquisition uh, for the Bahamian people. I'll just uh, touch on a few points raised by senators um, before I take my seat, Madam President. Senator Ramming, in his contribution, touched on the fact that historically we have had instances of substandard construction uh, when it comes to house, uh, government uh, sponsored housing, cost overruns, uh, et cetera, and he referenced the general operation of government enterprises and the fact that they um, need uh, reform and um, that we should not adopt the cookie cutter approach when it comes to design so that you can actually have, um, and I'm using my words now, what, what you would, um, not a, a cookie cutter, but a more natural um, subdivision or subdivision that has some character. Uh, which is, is supported. And I think um, we all acknowledge that in the past mistakes were made in terms of construction, sometimes even in terms of uh, site. I know um, we had some issues in, in Adelaide Gardens some time, some time ago and other, other places. And um, I am encouraged by some of the information provided by the current minister, uh, specifically when it speaks to the inspection regime that's being put in place with uh, inspectors on site as well from the Ministry of Work as well as from the private sector to ensure that you know, higher standards are met because people are spending their money, <laughs> their hard-earned money, sometimes all the money they have. And I have, I have experienced as a former, as a member, as a representative, the, the agony as, as a sum of um, um, colleague um, uh, ramming when you, you speak to people I remember this lady I went, you know, met her on Cowpen Road years ago I was a member of parliament for Adelaide back in between 2002 and 2007 so um, youngsters I'm, I'm a veteran you know <laughs> um, <laughs> I remember this lady um, Madam President and she had a job she worked at the airport, she worked at the hotel between the hours of 8 and 4, 8 and 3. And then she went to work at the airport between the hours of 4 and 12. I just saw her the other day, and she said, you know, she really wanted this home. She applied, 
in those days, not many people wanted to go that far, so it was easier. It wasn't the long, long lines. And um, it spoke to the dedication and, and the commitment and the sacrifice because she wanted somewhere for her children uh, to call their own. And then to see, you know, the difficulties with, with the home and all of the, um, you know, the, the back and forth that had to be had and the agony and the disappointment. Eventually, they, you know, they did a lot of work, but in the meantime, it was just a lot to have to deal with. And um, if, we, if we were to be quite, you know, frank, it has happened. And it is sad when, when it happened, and especially when you have people who put their all in. You have to make sure that we give them quality. And I think that the minister and her team, in, the, in this instance, have really gone that extra mile to make sure put those um, inspection uh, protocols in place to ensure that we can have quality uh, construction. The uh, Senator Ramming also referenced the South Beach Township that was laid out and not done. I think that has, uh, my inf I tried to get some information on that. And the information that I got was that the, yes, it was proposed by the uh, last uh, Ingram administration election intervened and there was not much progress uh, since. Uh, and the, I am advised that some of that land actually is either related or right next to this, um, this pine crest land. So I have to get, um, right, I have to, yeah, that, that is the advice that I, I was able to get quickly. So, um, I, I don't know why the, the exact um, program is not carried, but um, it, it lends then perhaps to, to the point that, you know, it, it, um, it, it can withstand the, the, the rain, et cetera. Um, Senator Pickstock, as he usually does, took us down um, a memory lane. And I think what it, it, it serves to um, have us appreciate how far we've come. Um, as Senator Seymour, in her contribution, again, expressed the desire to make sure that houses, you know, that they don't flood. And I think that lends to the, to the overall uh, point that we want to be able to deliver good quality homes for people. And I think that is all of our, our commitment. Uh, Senator also, Seymour also made the point of people who have applied previously. And it's the, it leads to the larger point of people needing to be assured that they are treated Fairly. And um, I, I would say that, you know, if um, Senator Seymour uh, said there might, there's a, there might be some applications already, um, but in her contribution, she did make the point that sometimes circumstances change. And so, yes, someone might have applied a few years ago, but let's say if their circumstances change, if they got tired of waiting and they found a place, or maybe they um, got divorced, or you know, their circumstances change. But the overall point is taken. And I think that is always challenge for, for government you want to be fair because you don't want someone to point a finger at you and say you only put PLPs in it or you only put FNMs in it. And there's, there's, there's different ways to do it. Do you do a first come first serve? Do you do a lottery? Or well, maybe a lottery. <laughs> a lottery would be a, a, a bad word. Or, or, but I think the, the point is taken. I think the point is taken because we're all the Haymans, we're all taxpayers, we're all contributors and nobody should be excluded because of any perceived um, leaning. And um, I think that's something that we all you know, strive for. And um, I, I think that's something that we all you know, strive for. And um, I, I was about to say that, you know, we are in a, the beauty of being in a, in a small community is that if we um, get complaints that someone feels that they are being unduly discriminated against that, you know, we can, we're all sitting here, we can bring that forward. But um, that is, that is, that is a, a um, long-standing concern. How do people feel? Some people don't even apply because they say, well, I don't know anybody. So, you know, and that is unfortunate because then they automatically exclude themselves and, and their chances. But that, that is, that is, um, that is a, a concern, but I, I can assure uh, the Senator uh, that is not the policy of this administration to um, exclude people because of their perceived uh, political support or otherwise. Um, Senator Seymour also uh, spoke about um, solar provisions and green and green space. Again, um, 
we have made, and I believe that that is a commitment of the ministry to um, incorporate solars, solar panels and solar energy to help to reduce the um, fuel bill, the um, energy bill, and green spaces, as has been said, is a, is a requirement of the, of the um, subdivision act. Um, Senator Barnett Ellis, in her contribution, uh, referenced again the fact that we must, uh, the overarching point, Madam President, is that we must make sure that we uh, provide that land that is used is suitable and that um, due diligence is done, if I were to uh, paraphrase um, or to summarize, it, due diligence is done to sort of ensure that we are giving people uh, value uh, for money. And um, I think there is a considerable due diligence done in terms of uh, the inspection, and that would be ongoing. Um, again, because, you know, the fact of the matter is, uh, frankly, we need to make sure that we give people a good quality house, because if they're moving in in a few months and they have a bad experience over the next few years, then, you know, we will reap. <laughs> 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 exactly. So we will be held accountable when I say we, this administration. And so I think it's in everybody's interest to make sure that, that we don't repeat those mistakes of the past. Because uh, Senator Henfield quite rightly said, people want to be involved, they want to be heard, and um, they want to be respected. And, um, you know, you can't just present somebody with somebody, something substandard and expect them to go quietly. Um, expect them to go away quietly. Uh, we have become much more uh, litigious in our maturity, uh, which is a good thing because it holds all of us uh, to account. Uh, Senator Griffin re reiterated the, re the very rigorous uh, inspection uh, regime and um, spoke about the fact that we have committed to these things, particularly extensive promises as it relates to housing and our blueprint for change. Uh, that we should um, really uh, stick to that, and uh, we agree. Um, uh, Senator Henfield uh, spoke about inflation and the impact being felt uh, by the public, and we are concerned about it. We are committed to bring relief. It's a vexing problem for us. Um, early signs showing that hopefully it might the, the increases might have peaked. It's very early, but again, people continue to feel the impact. And it's not something uh, that we can ignore. And we, I can say that we are looking at some, at some options uh, that, hope that we sh will be um, unveiling during the, in the next uh, two weeks when we present the, the budget. Um, it's, a, it's a matter that it's, it's dear to the heart of many colleagues and, and uh, to the Prime Minister. The issue of Crown land and, and um, and the need for reform, both in terms of how it's administered, in terms of being in the minister, the hands of the minister responsible for land, and when it comes to policy in terms of, as the senator said, um, get, getting land in the hands of um, Bahamians uh, so that they can spend some money on it, invest, and really promote um, domestic direct investment is the term. And um, I think that, that has merit. And it is, it is um, the, the fact that you have, that the process is concentrated and the process of application can be protract, protracted has caused uh, frustration over the years, um, a serious frustration. And the fact that um, you have, again, as the Sen Senator Henfield pointed to, um, the proliferation and the resurgence of shanties, which then, um, and when you combine it with the frustration of Bahamians who have applied, and then they can look and they perceive that um, illegals, they perceive that illegals can come and occupy, then they, they take um, some action and that, that uh, exacerbates the problem. So you have the problem here in the south, southeast, southwestern portion of the Providence where land is being cleared and, and structures are being erected and the government has to take action on that. Suffice it to say, yes, there is the need for reform. There needs to be a speedy uh, adjudication of applications. 
the things have to be done within the, the four corners of the law. Um, and we have to balance, the final point I want to make, Madam President, is that you know, when we're talking about the administration of Crown Land, we have to balance the need for satisfy those who want to apply to do an investment with the realization that it has been said around the table today that um, I think Mark Twain was told, quoted when he said there was there's no more land being made. So we have to balance what we give to uh, people today with the realization that 100, 200 years from now, there will be Bahamians and we have to uh, protect some of that asset for them who are yet unborn as well. So it is a it is a um, a good point and is, is something that that will be exercising us. But to when we speak about even growing the, and strengthening our, strengthening our economy, uh, one good way to do it is to get land in the hands of people to incentivize them to go to some of our, our family islands. And so, Madam President, once again, uh, we thank all of the senators who have contributed. Uh, we think this is a positive step. Um, the Minister of Housing and a team moving aggressively uh, to provide housing, uh, but we're always mindful that this, as has been said by many here today, this is the biggest single investment that many people will make in their lifetime. And so it's incumbent upon us that we give those people value for money in a home of which they and their children and their family uh, can be proud. <laughs> Thank you once again, all senators, Madam President, and I commend the resolution. As many as are in favor, say aye. aye. Those opposed, say nay. The motion is carried and the resolution is agreed. Discharge of select committees. Notices for future meetings. Uh, Madam President, I would like to renew all notices standing in the name of the government. Thank you. Can we have some order, please, Senators? Thank you. Notices for future meetings. Orders for clerk. Adjournment. Madam President, uh, I move that the Senate, Madam President, I, um, if I may foreshadow, I anticipate that we might uh, be uh, adjourning until Wednesday, the will be the 18th of May, which is next week, Wednesday, or possibly Thursday, where it's dependent upon um, how uh, what proceeds in that other place. Um, so I just wanted to say that to put <coughs> colleagues on notice that we'll meet either next week, Wednesday, or next week, Thursday. But for the purpose of the of the adjournment, uh, Madam President, I move. I would move at the, that the Senate, as at its rising, do adjourn sine die. Is there a seconder? It has been moved and seconded that the House that is rising do adjourn sine die. As many as in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The motion is carried. Final adjournment. Uh, Madam President, I move that the Senate do now adjourn. Is there a seconder? Second. It has been moved and seconded that the Senate do now adjourn. As many as in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The motion is carried. The Senate now stands adjourned. Sani die. <laughs>